This is Living Catholic with Father Don Wolf. Living Catholic is a fresh look at issues confronting each of us today. This show deals with living Catholic, what that means for Catholics, as well as the impact on the rest of society. You certainly don't have to be Catholic to enjoy this show. And now your host, Father Don Wolf. Welcome, Oklahoma, to Living Catholic. I'm Father Don Wolf, pastor of the Parish of Sacred Heart and rector of the Shrine of Blessed Stanley Rother. What we should talk about this week is going to communion. Uh, specifically, we, th- we should think about what's going on when we receive communion. After all, it is a time when a lot is going on. Mostly, we don't notice since we've done all this so many times, but we should notice what we're offered and what we receive. They count, and because they do, it matters to us. We should pay attention. The important element to notice is that when we go up to receive communion, we engage in this brief dialogue. The minister presents the host or the chalice and says, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, and we respond with our amen, the brief way to say, I believe, or yes, I affirm, and then we receive. doesn't take long. It's deliberately short and to the point, and we're done with communion. We hardly even think about it anymore. It's become almost automatic. And when we receive, we say, amen, to the body of Christ. As we learn from First Communion class, this is the promise Jesus made to us at the Last Supper. We are to receive his body and blood as the way to be sustained in our lifelong journey with him. And it's not just the words we say, and it's not just the act of receiving, of receiving what we're offered. We really do believe what we affirm. This is the body of Christ. It truly is the blood of Christ. And as we said before in some detail, Jesus' words are heard somewhat differently by us than they were first heard by the apostles. Because we live inside of a philosophical tradition in which people make a distinction between the body and the person. That's encapsulated so well by the phrase my old housekeeper at Holy Angels used to say. She would say, my body is tired. We all know what she meant. As she got older, she experienced fatigue and weakness that she wasn't used to. And while she had never been educated or schooled, she expressed exactly what we think when we use our words in their accustomed way. We experience our world by way of our bodies, but that's not quite the same as saying we experience the world as our bodies. We think of our bodies as apart from ourselves. My body is tired means this I, that is me, isn't quite the same as my body. I am something else, other, something more than my body. So when we hear Jesus say, take this and eat, this is my body, we hear him saying, take this offering of that which is part of me. And we receive the host or drink from the cup, and we imagine we're getting a part of what Jesus is. But Jesus was a Jew, and in his world, there was not a formal distinction between body and self. A person was his or her body and wasn't anything else. When Jesus said, take this and eat, this is my body, he said to their ears, take this, this is me, receive me. It's something more powerful and more substantial in the ears of those who heard it for the first time than it is for us, who hear the exact words, but we hear it in a somewhat different voice. This isn't new or somehow conspiratorial. It's something like when we use the phrase, at your service. Our intent is to assure someone will be helpful to them. But 300 years ago, at your service meant you were a servant, a person bound in relationship and custom, and probably in law, to do what your master demanded of you. For us, it's a polite way to tell people we'll be helpful. For those in the past, it was a commitment of life and the description of hierarchy. They're the same words, but they describe different understandings because they arise from different expectations. Jesus offers us himself. This is the gift of the Eucharist. This is why we receive it. We're given the fullness of the Lord's presence and the guarantee of his accompaniment in every part of our lives. By receiving Jesus' presence in our lives, there is no place, no part of our lives absent from the presence of Jesus and his companionship in our lives. Ultimately, our lives and his life become as one. This is what we're working toward in our Christian lives. Jesus lives in us and by way of our decisions and actions and initiatives. As St. Paul put it in his letter to the Galatians, we are to be one in Christ. This is why the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist is so vital. It's how we become one with him. 
Of course, we have to overcome our doubts as we put the host in our mouth or as we sip from the chalice. After all, what we see and taste seems to be simply bread and wine. But we're asked to look beyond the limitations of their appearances. We are to trust that this true presence is beyond appearances and beyond all of the attributes that we can see and measure. Our invitation is to look beyond just what's there to see what is really actually present. And for many people, this is a difficulty. Many people stumble on this aspect of the faith. They can't get beyond the limitation of appearances. They're captured by what they see and they can't see beyond it. We can appeal to faith, we can invoke the tradition, and we can teach from the scriptures, but they don't see it. For them, the Eucharist isn't a gift, it's a problem. And that's too bad. Often I think that we don't teach the faith well. We ask people to regard the essence of the faith, like in this situation, in a whole different category of understanding. We teach them that faith is somehow outside of the boundaries of the experience and should become the product of their force of will, rather than faith being the conclusion of what is obvious and actual. That's too bad, because the truth of the matter is that the real presence of things beyond what we see and taste is what we believe actually about most of the world. If we plunge into the depths of what we do every day, we'll find that what the church asks of us and what Jesus offers us is as straightforward as loving a child or showing up on time. That is, the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist is a promise made to us in all obviousness. Think about it. There are many occasions in which what we know is real is much greater than what we see and experience. For example, we all know what it was like to have our mother say yes when she really meant no. We could hear her words and even ask her about them, but in our hearts we knew what her real response was even if her words were something different. The real truth of the matter in that situation was something different than the experience of the moment. It was the product of what we understood and what we knew to be true. And all of this was apart from what mom may have said or done. Or as another example, we know what it's like when a friend says, I did this for you, and we understood he really did it for himself. The truth of the matter, the real presence of this action is something different than its content. We can measure every aspect of what actually took place when he chose to act and see that his action is just as he said it is. But we can also know more and know there's more to it, something else there in the midst of what's being done. What's real is bigger than the thing that's there. Or yet another example, we know what it's like when our father never said anything negative about something we'd done but we knew he was disappointed. Perhaps there was never a word spoken. Perhaps he'd never acted out some pantomime of disgust or sadness, but we knew. He hoped we would do something other than what we actually did. Again, the situation could be analyzed and by looking at every detail, but the reality of what was there is bigger than the sum of those. We know the reality is larger than the things in it. That's a common experience of life. We know them because we've lived through them. In fact, if someone were to approach us and insist that there really is nothing to our mom and dad's expectations or disappointments because we couldn't measure them or quantify them exactly, we would think that they were flat and foolish. Imagining reality is only just what you can see and hear and gauge. If that's all there is to the world of relationship and reality, then life has become truly small. It certainly won't have much meaning. When we insist the host given out at Mass is truly the body of Christ, we're making a claim about what we know is real to us. It's hardly more bold than the claims we make about the content of our reality each day. To claim to know my mother loved me, even though she's been absent from me, from me for 52 years. I claim that true. Her love is still one of the most basic realities of my life. And I know it's true, not just in memory, but because her love lives in me. I know the desire of my father to provide for us. It moved his life, even though all he built and worked for has turned to dust. His drive to do all this still lives in how I act and how I am in the world. It would live in me even if I had forgotten his name or lapsed in my responsibilities. Or to quote one of the world's most famous atheists, Freeman Dyson, he said, quote, This world is not simply some cosmic accident and has no relationship to me in my life. 
I belong to this world. It's not a stranger to me, unquote. Gazing into the atomic lattices that make up the molecules of structures and looking through the telescopes at the whirling stars of a galaxy, he knew the real presence of the universe included him, even though what he observed was either too small or too large for him to be standing among it. Real presence, his real presence, was an act of faith he asserted as a matter of fact for him. And he did so without a thought about making a distinction between what he considered real and those things he could put his hands on or touch or taste or feel. He knows that what is real is beyond the data of the senses. So when people began to become serious about the advances of science, they began to think of the world as no more than the sum of the energies and matter that moved among it. And as they did, they looked askance at the real presence of Jesus. Talking about real presence or the true meaning of what was there didn't answer their questions about what the Eucharist really is. There was no way to measure or divide or study the change of meaning in what we, con- or in what we consume at communion. And so it became very popular to imagine it was meaningless because it couldn't be quantified or denominated. Even today, precocious young students will challenge me by their naive assertion that no one can prove the presence of Christ scientifically. They imagine scientific claims to be the only coin of the realm when it comes to meaning or purpose. This immeasurability was actually provided for in the teaching about the Eucharist known as transubstantiation. This complicated sounding term merely explains that while what the bread looks and tastes like doesn't change, the true reality that is there changes. Study it all you want. It'll have all the characteristics of a piece of bread, but what it is, is the body of Christ. It really is not measurable by whatever tools science can bring to it, like a mother's love, a girlfriend's interest, a father's loyalty, none of them can be accounted for by calipers or microscopes or measuring tapes. There's no place that can be located by any of the tools we bring to size up our world. Science can bring explanations about the phenomena that surround these things, of course. Careful measurements can note something like an increased blood flow to our extremities or pupil dilation or a raised heartbeat. But those measurements are only the results of the what of the reality not the reality itself. Yet we know these things exist and are as real as a meteor shower and as certain as the sunrise. There is a reality suffusing what we see and experience, unavailable to the measurements of science, but real and certain nonetheless. When we're asked to understand and then affirm that Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist we receive, we're not asked to invest a moment of faith impossible to imagine or inconsistent with the rest of life. It's true, the reality of Jesus' presence is deeper and more consequential than the depth and meaning of the other truths of our reality, but it is of the same manner. Besides, while the sad divisions of Christianity have damaged the consistent belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, Christians all over have no difficulty affirming their belief in the presence of Christ in other elements and experiences. Just as Catholics do, Christians everywhere believe Jesus is present in the scriptures, in the assembly that gathers, in the whole church together, and in the movement of our hearts. Each of these affirmations is an act of faith. Each of them requires us to believe in what is larger than the sum of our experiences. And no Christian blanches at their affirmation of them. Finding fault in the real presence of the Eucharist is more a schooled response than a reflective one. However, denying Jesus' presence in the Eucharist is a real problem among us. For much of the history of the church, it was simply taken for granted as the content of the faith. It was viewed to be obvious and without question. In our age, much of what passed for common knowledge has been evacuated of meaning and we're left trying to understand where we are in this diminished world. The crisis of real presence is felt all over the church, in Sacred Heart Parish as much as any place in the world. We have a problem communicating and understanding the gift of real presence among us. On the one hand, wherever the church is, it is part of the world, and we never escape the realities and the challenges of the world, even when we, pre- we, we, even when we preach the gift of God and the truths of God's transcendent promises. On the other hand, we cannot escape, we can't escape going beyond the boundaries of the world and its wisdom to preach the truths of God's revelation. As we preach about the real presence in our world today, one of the great difficulties is the conviction that there is no real presence 
of anyone to anything at all. Our challenge isn't just to get people to believe in the real presence of Jesus in the communion we receive on Sunday. It's to get people to believe that it's possible to be present to one another in any way. We've entered a time in which the experience of presence grows more and more alien and more and more complicated in the day-to-day of our world. We believe more in the truth of the real absence than in any real presence. We see it across the spectrum of anxiety we experience about affirming our own history and membership in our nation. The sense of being American has faded in this last generation so that we are less and less secure about being part of the body of American life. In previous generations, the prospect of being a citizen meant a connection to the history and meaning of being together as a people. Despite our differences, we presumed we had our experiences and our convictions in common. They provided us with the assurance of something called being an American that we could share together. It was recognized and celebrated and affirmed. But this confidence in the real presence of what an American is has begun to fade. The invisible bonds to be shared that bind us together as Americans have lessened their power to hold us. Some people have even begun to question if they were ever truly real. What once seemed obvious to everyone, both in the U.S. and out of it, is now critiqued as never having really existed. Many are asking if we're real or not. Maybe, they say, there is no such thing as an American identity other than the accident of geography or the randomness of our birth. We have a problem believing in the presence of our own history, of our own place, of our own story. Or we can look at the challenges posed by the convictions of those who affirm the transgender worldview. According to their assertions, a person's body is not present to the person as an integral fact of existence and meaning. A person born with male body parts and male-specific organs, each one of whose trillion cells is imprinted with the genes denoting his distinctions of male and female, is not necessarily present to that body, they say. This man can affirm that his body that carries him around is a stranger to who he really is and needs to be altered so as to be acceptable. The person is a stranger to the body that is lived in, and the body is a stranger to the person who lives there. There is no presence there, only coincidence. That's the transgender claim. We live in a world in which we cannot affirm that our own bodies are a real presence to us, to ourselves. Is it any wonder people have a hard time affirming the Eucharist as the real body of Christ? If I don't know I'm a real body, can I know that what I receive is the body of Christ? This is pernicially pernicious when dealing with all that we presume of an integrated self. After all, if we are uncertain of the reality of the body we occupy, then the other invisibles about which we are certain today will begin to fade or disappear into uncertainty tomorrow. It's hard to imagine that the disappearance of a common belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist has become coincidental with the disappearance of the real presence of a world in which we can trust, but it has become so. If the confidence with which we address the world we know begins to flag, then it is replaced with the skepticism that leads to dissolution. That's the greatest challenge that face us of all other challenges. If a man can look at himself and declare himself a woman and demand to be regarded as a woman because of that declaration, being a woman becomes of no more reality than pronouncing the words to make it so. Then any pronouncement, any word can be considered the same way. If a man can be a woman by saying so, then no word has any meaning at all. So slavery is freedom and war is peace becomes as real as I am a woman, or I was born in the wrong body. After a while, when we become strangers to what is real, what makes our acquaintance is the impossibility of knowing any reality at all. When we are not present to anything, then nothing becomes present to us. Eventually, we'll become unable to be presentable to anyone, and we're tipping into those experiences already. Again, it's hard to imagine that the fate of society may may hinge on our practice of the Eucharist. But if we cannot affirm the reality of what is offered us in Jesus, then we will eventually find it impossible to affirm the true presence of anything or anyone in the world. 
The pathway out of the confusions and indefiniteness of our time is the true encounter with Christ. Offering his real presence is meaningless, no matter how overwhelmingly true it is, if it doesn't matter to us. Remember, most of the people in Galilee and in Jerusalem encountered Jesus in the flesh. They heard his words, they saw his miracles, but, and, but he was believed and known by only a handful. Holding up the body of Christ as an offer to the whole world won't matter if there's no invitation to encounter the body of Christ. This Lent is the invitation. We have the chance to affirm the real presence while we also appreciate it to be the encounter with Christ truly among us. As we make our way up the aisle to receive communion, we should keep in mind the insight of the disciples on their way to Emmaus. They had known Jesus in the flesh and had followed him to Jerusalem as he culminated his ministry at the celebration of the Passover there. Their hopes were dashed when he was arrested and convicted and crucified. All they had thought of him evaporated in the heat of a Good Friday afternoon. And as they made their way back home, they encountered him again on the road, resurrected, but they didn't understand who it was. After interacting with him for the entire afternoon, they stopped and ate together. And when he broke bread with them in the great Eucharistic act while they were at table together, then they saw and understood. It was truly Jesus present to them. That's when they saw. That's when they got it. Before that moment, Jesus was a wish, a wistful longing. He walked along with them and disputed the Bible with them, but they were absent to his presence. When they were together at the table with him, they came to know him in the breaking of bread. He became present to them in their time and space. He was amidst them where they were. At the table, he was there, but he was also, but he was there also in their longing and their anxiety and their questioning. His presence became the real presence when they brought themselves to the table and found him there with them. And most of all, as it said in the scriptures, they realized it, that it had been he who had been with them all day long. That's the real presence of the encounter. When we encounter Christ this way on our journey, it is he who is with us. Look around at the journey of your life. Think about the longings and desires you carry with you and all the steps you've taken. Examine your memories and look through your dreams and see where you have gone in your life and then come to the table and receive what is offered there. At the culmination of the Eucharistic prayer, the priest holds the host high and proclaims, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is what we are invited to receive into our lives, into the dreams and memories and journeys we take. When we receive Christ there, well, there he is. That's what we're offered. It can make all of the difference in the world. It'll make all the difference to the world. Back in just a moment. Welcome back to our final segment, Faith in Verse. We have a poem today called The Snow Last Sunday. The snow that fell so suddenly melted quickly the next day. Flakes floating so beautifully sailed through the windy space. And oh, it was comical to observe the sight because we had become laughable trying to get our times aright. Two days before we in shirt sleeves secretly mourned winter gone. February warmth had seeded the season to greening lawns. Maybe the climate is idiotic and all has now come unmoored. Turns out seasons are periodic with their truths still unexplored. So as this very brief interlude comes to its liquid finality, we are permitted to conclude nature clings to her vitality. That's the snow last Sunday. to come, I hope that we can together explore what it means to be Living Catholic. Living Catholic is a production of Oklahoma Catholic Radio. To learn more, visit okcr.org.